Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much indeed, Ed, for inviting me, and thank you very much indeed to the Spencer family. Um, I'm absolutely delighted and honoured to be presenting this lecture this evening. So I've got a terrible cough, so forgive me if I um, pause for water during my presentation. Okay, so let's start off with policy making. On the face of it, policy making in UK higher education presents a very positive picture of the experiences of BME groups. So we've had the widening participation agenda, which was introduced by the new Labour government. The widening, widening participation agenda is very important because its aim was to progress um, um, students from marginalised communities and BME communities into higher education. And it has shown that it has been successful. The McPherson report, which was published in 1999, was very important because it resulted in the Race Relations Amendment Act 2000. And the Race Relations Amendment Act introduced a definition of institutional racism. So the Race Relations Amendment Act was key in, in understanding how racism was meant to be, was, is meant to be understood. The Equality Act was introduced in 2010. The Equality Act is a very important piece of legislation because it brings together all previous legislation into one single act. And the reason the Equality Act is important is because it contains protected characteristics of which race is one. We've also had the Athena Swan Charter, which, which was introduced to progress the numbers of women in STEM subjects in higher education. And 10 years since its introduction, the Athena Swan has shown to be beneficial in terms of women's progress in STEM. However, I argue that the main beneficiaries of Athena Swan have been white, middle-class women. The Race Equality Charter was recently introduced to progress the numbers of BME students in higher education and also to look at how race was manifesting in higher education. The Race Equality Charter is very new um, and recently only 21 institutions applied for the award and only eight were awarded. So universities are awarded a bronze, silver or gold in relation to these awards. So what we've seen is positive advances in terms of policy making. So we have all these policies which show that we're doing really well on the face of it. However, in terms of, for instance, the Athena Swan Charter, gender has been given precedence over race. And the main beneficiaries of the Athena Swan Charter have been women, specifically white middle class women. So in that respect, race has been left behind. We've also seen an increase in the numbers of black and minority ethnic students attending higher education institutions. And I'll show you the statistics on that in a moment. But it must be noted as a footnote that there are differences within and between the different BME groups. So we have to be careful in terms of how we use that category. So I am aware of those differences. However, dis despite these significant advances in policy making and changes in the student body where we have this significant increase in BME students and indeed staff, inequalities around racism, exclusion and marginalisation continue to exist. Let me show you the evidence. So I think it's really important to start off in terms of giving you a contextual background, uh, particularly in relation to the BME population. So from the last census, BME groups make up 14% of, of the minority ethnic population. And in the years 2016 to, 70, to 17, nearly, well, 98.4% of UK students disclosed their ethnicity. So 22.7% were BME. So you can see the differences within that category, but the highest percentage is black students. So 9.6% of students identified as black. So the proportion of students who have seen the most significant growth over the last 10 years have been black students. But what I'm going to argue and show you is that whilst they have seen, the statistics show us that they are the group who are growing in terms of numbers, they are the ones who continue to suffer the most amount of dis discrimination and exclusion. So, white students, and this is the most recent data tw from 2016-17, so if you are a white student, you are more likely to receive a first or a 2-1 degree compared to BME students 
or on the whole, but there are differences within that category. So Chinese, Indian, and mixed heritage students are more likely to receive a first compared, again, to black students. So the statistics tell us that, again, if you are a black student, you are less likely to leave university with a 2-1 or a first. And actually, taking a step back, you are also less likely to attend a Russell Group or an elite university in the first place. And again, I'll show you the, st the statistics for that in a minute. So there is a BME attainment gap of 13.6 percentage points from the most recent statistics that we have. And again, it's the black students who are the most disadvantaged in terms of the BME attainment gap. The BME attainment gap, however, is lower for Chinese and particularly Indian students and mixed heritage students. So the statistics tell us that black students are the most disadvantaged in terms of degree attainment. So let's talk about inequality, inequality, inequality. So when BME students achieve good A-level grades compared to white students on average, I have said that there are differences within the category. So Indian students and Chinese students do better, but again, black students are disadvantaged. But the statistics tell us that the black students are less likely to be able to make the application to selective universities such, such as Oxbridge or indeed Russell Group universities. So the reason behind that is my own research shows for, in, for example, bright students attending state schools are less likely to be encouraged to apply to Oxbridge or indeed Russell Group universities. Mediocre students attending private schools are more likely to be encouraged to apply. Because in independent private schools, there are salaried members of staff whose main job is to get those students to apply to these elite universities. So, for example, Students who are attending state schools, many students and their parents are unaware that their UCAS applications for elite universities such as Oxbridge have to be uh, in, in September rather than December. They have to attend an interview and sometimes they have to do an entrance test. So my research has found that students who attend fee-paying schools are more likely to have access to that knowledge, that cultural and social capital, and also are more likely to be trained in terms of the interview and to know what to expect and be trained for the entrance exams. So they are less likely in the beginning to have access to those kind of benefits that private education brings. There's also evidence to suggest that when they do apply, they are less likely to be offered places compared to white students with comparable A-level results. So there's a process of discrimination taking place even when those students have comparable grades. And David Lamy has equated this to a process of social apartheid. So in 2017-2018, there was one college in Oxford, in Oxford that did not admit one single British BME student. So therefore, the conclusion from the statistics and the evidence tells us that BME students are underrepresented in prestigious elite and Russell Group universities. Black students are also more likely to drop out of university, citing an ethnocentric curriculum, favoritism towards white students, and racism. Those are the tip of the iceberg, and those are examples in 2018. So I think it's really important to think about the ways in which privilege manifests itself. And I think it's important perhaps to take a step back from higher education and to understand what students are doing before um, they come to higher education. And I've always said this, that sometimes in some respects it, it, it's, it's a bit late when we get students into higher education because my research shows that by that time this notion of privilege is, is, is already um, instilled in terms of progress and social mobility and future life chances of individuals. So, for instance, 6.5% of school children in the UK attend independent schools compared to 93% who attend state schools. 55% of privately educated children progress to Russell Group institutions, including 6% who went on to study at Oxford or Cambridge. 
So I argue that we have a process of advantage is already awarded to those who are, who are already in advantageous positions. So once privileged, always privileged. But that doesn't just happen before university, it happens after most university in relation to access to the labour market, high earning potential and, and future life chances. And this is based on issues of social class, wealth and indeed ethnicity. And I argue that these processes of exclusion are based on white privilege, which is also related to access to social, cultural and economic capital. And education is a right and not a privilege. So I believe that every individual, regardless of their ethnicity, their social class background and their access to wealth, has a right to a decent education. But that is not the case. Education is now a privilege. So those who, who succeed continue to be privileged in later life. So if you can, take your minds back to Monday the 13th of April, 2015. Monday the 13th of April 2015 was a typical day in modern British politics. An Oxford University graduate in philosophy, politics and economics, PPE, Ed Miliband, law launched the Labour Party's general election manifesto. It was examined by the PP BBC's political editor, Oxford PPE graduate Nick Robinson. It was also examined by the BBC's economics editor, Oxford PPE graduate Robert Peston. And it was also examined by the director of the Institute for Fiscal Studies, Oxford PPE graduate Paul Johnson. Get the gist, yeah? <laughs> it was criticised by the Prime Minister, Oxford PPE graduate David Cameron. It was defended by the Labour shadow chancellor, Oxford PPE graduate Ed Balls. Elsewhere in the country, with the election three weeks looming away, the Liberal Democrat Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Oxford PPE graduate Danny Alexander, was preparing to visit Kensington, Kingston, I beg your pardon, and Surbiton, a vulnerable London seat held by a fellow Lib Dem minister, Oxford PPE graduate Ed Davey. In Kent, one of UKIP's two MPs, Oxford PPE graduate Mark Reckless, what an unfortunate name, <laughs> was campaigning in his constituency, Rochester and Strood. Comments on the day's developments were being posted online by Michael Crick, <laughs> and political correspondent of Channel 4 News. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our political elite. What do they all have in common? But they're all white, they're all middle class, and they're all men. So, as I've said, I think it's really important to, of course, not look at higher education in isolation. We have to look at students' experiences before they enter our higher education. But we also need to be aware of the importance of transitions from undergraduate to postgraduate talk or postgraduate research. And this is important because in a minute I'm going to show you the statistics of higher education and BME academics. And this is why this is, this is hugely important. So the statistics show us that BME students have continued to have higher rates of transition to postgraduate masters taught master's um, courses, but white students are the ones who continue to have higher rates of transition into postgraduate research, i.e. doing PhDs and being registered for PhDs. So our research has found that access to financial and economic capital affects transitions to PhD study, which we argue has a significant impact and affects access to the labour market and social mobility. So in our recent research, quoted there, we found that, for instance, again, black students are the most disadvantaged even at this level. So black students who, who knew they were on track to get a 2-1 or, or a first were less likely to register for a PhD because they did not have access to financial and economic capital which would enable them to do that. The only financial capital that was available was through bursaries and they were few and far between. Indian students, however, that we spoke to and Chinese students were more likely to register for a PhD but also were on the same track in terms of getting a 2-1 or a 1st 
But many of them said to us, well, actually, I can, my parents can pay for this or I can lend the money from my family. So they had access to family, social and economic capital, which, which was hugely beneficial in terms of social mobility. So our own research and other research suggests that this, in, in some sense, has a domino effect for the experiences of black students within the labour market. Because black students incur an ethnic penalty, penalty and what, or we, what we call a black graduate tax. That's what we call, that's what we call it in our 2018 Bhopal, Myers and Pitkin research, where they are more likely to be unemployed six months after they graduate compared to white groups. However, this does vary uh, by ethnic groups. Again, Indian students and Chinese students less likely. Black students are the most disadvantaged. And that does vary by gender and indeed geographical location. And there's also recent evidence to suggest that there is a BME ethnic pay gap within higher education. And BME employees face a 3.2 billion annual pay penalty within the labour market, found, within the labor market which has recently been found by the Resolution Foundation. So the narrative and the story that I'm trying to tell here is that whilst it's important to understand student experiences at HE, it's also important to look at that journey and how that works from, if you like, primary and secondary education to transitions into higher education, but also transitions out of higher education into the labour market. So let's now look at the BME staff demographics and, and again, um, why this is important in terms of uh, black, black students less likely to do PhDs because in order to become uh, an academic and work in a university, you do have to have a PhD um, these days, although I would say that is, it, that's always been the case. So if you're less likely to be registered on a PhD and have a PhD, you're less likely to uh, get a job in higher education. So of those with known ethnicity, 9.4% of UK staff identified as BME. So the proportion of BME staff who are UK has again shown an increase um, within the last 10 years. And those who are non-UK has also shown an, an increase. However, among UK academic staff, there are only 0.8% of BME staff who are heads of institutions. So out of 154 higher education institutions in the UK, we only have three vice chancellors who are from a British BME background. And a larger proportion of white staff are are more likely to be on the highest pay spine of 59,500 or more compared to BME staff. So these inequalities that I'm talking about continue to manifest within the labour market, particularly the higher education labour market, which is something that we're focusing, I'm focusing on today. The evidence also sh shows us that among both UK and again non-UK academic staff, BME staff are more likely to be on fixed term contracts uh, compared to white staff and again there are issues around that and particularly around zero hours contracts, access to sick pay, access to holiday pay and access to all the other benefits such as a good pension etc. So they, they are more likely to be in insecure positions. UK BME staff are underrepresented at the highest contract level, but they're overrepresented at the lowest. So again, we have that discrepancy in terms of um, how, where the discrimination is actually taking place at different levels. A higher proportion of both UK and non-UK BME staff were on research-only contracts compared to white staff. And again, being on the, a research-only contract has implications in terms of your future career trajectories. Research-only contracts tend to be over a sh short period of time. They tend not to be um, secure contracts, and you're less likely to be promoted on these kind of contracts. So I thought it would, was, um, would be interesting for you to look at the figures in terms of professors, which is... Um, the highest grade in terms of an academic can achieve in a university. Um, that's, that's not including um, vice chancellors, pro vice chancellors, etc. Et so these are the figures. This, this is what the, fig the re most recent figures. So there are 13,000, 13 and a half thousand white professors um, in the UK, 
The total of the BME is 1,235. And again, it's black academics who, the, who are the most disadvantaged. So the story that I'm telling you here is that the disadvantages that black individuals experience within, as being students is, is very similar in terms of looking at staff the staff makeup. So there's only 85 black professors in the UK and only 26 of them are women. So why is this happening? So why is this happening in universities which are or which are hmm <laughs> which portray themselves as liberal, progressive, inclusive, and they have social justice um, at the heart of their agenda. And certainly when I started many, many, over 25 years ago as an academic, uh, that is what I, that's one of the reasons I became an academic, because I thought that um, the, the academy would suit me because it's very liberal, it's left-leaning, it's pro progressive. Oh boy, was I in for a shock, but, um, you know, well... Let's see, let's, see, let's see where we are. Um, there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that racism, exclusion, and marginalisation continues to exist in higher education for students and staff. And, and those um, stories that I showed you, those uh, news stories, were just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are many, many more. Those were just the tip of the iceberg from 2018. So there are stereotypes of students. So white middle-class students are seen as ideal pupils. They're seen as those who will succeed and do very well. Chinese students are seen as quiet and, quiet and passive. And black and Muslim students are, put, are seen as being loud, challenging, and aggressive. And these stereotypes exist and are manifested not, through by, not just by students themselves, but lecturers and academics themselves have these stereotypes of, of what they expect from, from students and how they see these students progressing within their degrees. And I've already talked to you about, um, discussed with you, the BME attainment gap. Um, and processes of unconscious bias, or indeed conscious bias, continue to exist in higher education, where there are certain expectations from students and staff. And most recently, and forgive me, I don't have the quote here, I read a study that was published last year, which showed that um, students are more likely to rate white middle-class men higher in their evaluations compared to academics of colour who are, are more likely to get lower evaluations in their student evaluations. And why is that important? That's important because it will actually, it, well, it's important for the TEF um, um, significantly, but also in terms of recruitment practices and who universities decide who they will recruit, but also in terms of promotion and who gets promoted. So I want to talk a little bit about white privilege and how I relate this to um, this whole process of, of some of the things I've talked about in higher education. And I think it's really important um, to talk about Peggy McIntosh's work, and I know it's dated, but it, it's absolutely superb in terms of the way in which Peggy McIntosh defines and describes white privilege. So she says that white privilege is like an invisible rucksack um, of special provision. So it's something that's on, on your back and you walk um, through life where you're less likely to be stopped by the police, you, you can walk through customs without being stopped and you can get a seat in a restaurant, etc, etc. So it contains special provisions and these are maps, passport, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and indeed blank checks. So white privilege enables you to have access to particular forms and types of privilege. But Derek Bell, who is a critical race theory theorist, he argues that racist hierarchical structures govern all political, economic, and social domains, all political, economic, social domains. Such structures, he says, allocate the privileging of whites in all arenas, including Education. So education is not exempt from processes of white privilege. So I argue um, in my work that there are different shades of whiteness. So, it, so there's, there's different shades of whiteness and there's different shades and types and forms of white privilege. So there's acceptable and non-acceptable legitimate and illegitimate forms of whiteness. So for example, gypsy, travel, gypsy and traveler groups may define themselves as white but their whiteness is illegitimate and it's unacceptable. So 
even though they, def they are defined as white, they define themselves as, as white, they do not have those privileges afforded to white middle class privilege. So I want to talk a little bit about um, policy making, which I touched on in the first slide, and I want to talk about who benefits from what I call white policy making and how it works. So we have the Race Equality Charter Mark, we have the Equality Act, and we have all these policies which, which seem to suggest that we're moving in the, the right direction. But what I want to do here is I want to disrupt that way of looking at, at how white policy making works, specifically in relation to issues of social justice. So Derek Bell argues that whites will advance the course of racial justice only when doing so coincides with their own self-interest. So, for instance, universities will only sign up to the Race Equality Charter, Mark, if it benefits them, if it positions them higher in the league tables, if it, if it gives them the image of being inclusive. They're not really that concerned in advancing racial justice, but what they are more concerned is of how it benefits them themselves. And my colleague, David Gilborn, he argues that the continued promotion of policies and practices that are known to be racially divisive testifies to a tacit intentionality in the system. So he makes no qualms. He says this is entirely intentional. And Gloria Ladson Billings argues that whites are the main beneficiaries of educational policy making, even though these policies are designed to serve the marginalised. So there's a huge amount of evidence to suggest that the main beneficiaries of affirmative action in the US have been white women. And, and as I've said, in the UK, the main beneficiaries of the Athena Swan Charter have been white middle class women. And the main beneficiaries of equality policy making in higher education have been white women. So these policies are actually not designed and don't tackle the real inequalities. And I argue, as long as white identity and white privilege are not threatened, white groups are supportive of diversity and inclusion programs, such as, for instance, affirmative action or indeed the Race Equality Charter. Consequently, I argue, they can sell themselves as diverse and fair as long as their white privilege remains intact and unthreatened. So I think it's, again, um, important to talk about white privilege in relation to the white space of higher education and how I tackle it in terms of, of arguing that white privilege manifests, its, manifests itself differently in different spaces. And, and, the white, um, and the white space of the academy is really important here. And white space, um, according to Kobayashi, Kobayashi and Peake, argue whiteness is a, is a normative identity in which power and privilege are translated by controlling dominant values and institutions, and, and in particular by occupying space within a segregated landscape. So that's really the premise in which I work from in examining how higher education is a space which is segregated and remains so. However, of course, we have to be aware that the meaning of race and how we understand it varies from location to location. But equally, according to Hartigan, it also depends on the set of concerns against which this is prioritised and, al and also the other forms of consciousness or the modes of reading with which it is ranked and arranged. So it's not simple to understand uh, white space as... Uh, in its, um, as, as a disparate space, if you like. It has to be understood within its whole, whole entirety and how it affects other spaces within that one location. And in relation to higher education, I argue that universities are key spaces in which whiteness and white identities predominate, not just in the representation of white groups, occupying senior decision-making roles, and I've shown you the statistics and evidence for that. But I argue that this is also evidence in the curriculum, and indeed approaches to diversity, inclusion, and social justice, which I suggest manifest through a rhetoric, but isn't, isn't actually evidence in outcomes or indeed practice. So what I want to do now is to... In telling my story today, what I want to do now is I've, I think I've, well, 
I, I'm confident to say I've given you the evidence. Now I want to um, demonstrate that evidence through a study that um, I was commissioned to do by what was then the, a couple of years ago the ECU. So this study is a demonstration of everything that I've just said. So there's, there was very little research that looked at minority ethnic flight from the UK um, in higher education. And just to say that this was done before Brexit and before Trump, and that's really significant. <laughs> um, I think if we, had, if we do it now, I think we would get different results. So there was anecdotal evidence and some home office evidence to suggest that uh, BME academics in the UK were leaving UK higher education to work overseas um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and there was no real research that actual, actually tackled this. So we were asked to carry out this piece of research to understand the reasons for higher education migration and to explore whether in fact there were ethnic differences and whether the anecdotal evidence was indeed correct. And also to understand the push and pull factors, um, but, but indeed examine actual or indeed potential higher education migration. And also to establish, if this was the case, what, what should UK higher education be, institutions be doing to reta retain this talent that we were supposedly losing? So we distributed a questionnaire survey to all higher education institutions in the UK. We analysed it statistically so that we would have some kind of evidence of descriptive statistics so that we could make a general, general point about the story in terms of what we were presenting. But we also did some in interviews. We did 41 in-depth interviews uh, with 14 UK-based academics, 12 who had worked overseas and 15 who, who were already overseas. And we analysed that uh, through thematic analysis. So, um, considering that we sent the questionnaire to all HEIs, how many responses do you think we received? So there's 154 HERs. Any, any um, numbers, anyone? One, two, ten? <laughs> Fifty. Gosh, you guys are not very optimistic, are you? <laughs> we actually received 1,200, which was fantastic. Um, and I did literally fall off my chair. Because uh, I was only because I thought if we get 500, then we can give some um, some we can tell a good story with some a positive um, regression analysis. So we received 1,200, and that was the spread of, spread of our survey responses, which was fantastic. But one of the things that um, I was particularly concerned with was the number at the bottom, where we only received. 211 responses from academics working in post-1992 universities and 732 in traditional red brick universities. So, um, because my hunch was that there were differences between types of universities, but because the numbers were not big enough, unfortunately, um, our regression analysis wasn't strong enough to tell a story. So I'd be interested in, in any comments in, as to why that was. Um, conversations suggest that it may be different ethical procedures in post-1992 universities. Other conversations suggest that, that uh, academics were far too busy teaching <laughs> to fill out a survey. So that may well be the case. So... Our responses showed that, yes, our hypothesis was correct. BME academics were more likely um, to consider uh, a move overseas compared to white academics, but we also found that more did actually go on to eventually reject this idea. Uh, and again, this is pre-Trump. I think it would be different now, or maybe it wouldn't, but the USA then was considered the most desired destination for black, Asian, white, and mixed ethnicities. Those from Arab, Jewish, Hispanic, and Latin and other um, ethnicities were more likely to consider a move to Europe. And the biggest deciding factor was the offer of full-time permanent post, whether it was in the UK or overseas. And one of the things that we found um, in, in the survey was that, um, particularly in the open-ended questions, that respondents did talk a lot about zero-hours contracts and moving from contract to contract um, and, and the fact that that, that zero hours contracts were very, very insecure. And in another piece of research um, that I've, uh, which hasn't been published yet, that I've been involved in, we've actually been looking at individuals who are on zero hours contracts. So these zero hours contracts are advertised, for instance, as £45 per hour. 
okay? But that does not actually include the preparation time, the delivery of the lecture and the marking and all the other support that individuals give to students. And we've worked it out that it's actually about £5 an hour which is lower than the minimum wage. And I think it's absolutely disgraceful that universities are engaging in um, zero-hours contracts. So the positive elements of working in U UK higher education was, first of all, um, as I've spoken about zero-hours contracts, was having a full-time permanent post. That was absolutely key uh, for obvious re reasons. Having a good pension was also important, but also... Um, our respondents did actually feel that they were treated with equity. They felt as though they were respected. They felt as though their needs were heard and actually addressed. So that was something that was a good finding in terms of what, what we were not actually expected to find. And many also discussed um, higher education in the UK being very cooperative and indeed collegiate. Um, and most of the respondents who had, um, ch especially children, talked about the family-friendly policies in higher education. So, for instance, one of our respondents said that it's great, I can drop my daughter off at school, I can then come to work, and then I can pick her up again. So the family-friendly policies were very, very important for both men and women, actually. Um, and I think that Family-friendly policies are becoming ever more increasingly important given Athena Swan, um, which, is, which is one of the things that awarding bodies look at in terms of Athena Swan and when it's awarded. So what were the push factors from, from the UK and the barriers to promotion? So the BME academics that we talked to, they said that the, their career hit the buffers. So for many of them, this was at the stage of level six, so that would be a reader stroke associate professor. So many of them felt that their career came to a certain point where they felt that they could not go any further. At that point, their prospects were limited and their promotion was actually seen as an illusion. And when they did go for promotion, they felt as though there was the, a, a lack of transparency in terms of where where they were going. So we know that there are criteria that one has to address and, and make sure that these are, are ticked off, if you like, but they felt that this criteria was actually nebulous. You know, It was more about who you knew, whether your face fitted, and whether the university wanted you to represent them. So the, the criteria was very nebulous, nebulous. BME academics felt that they were judged much more harshly compared to their white colleagues, and that different criteria were introduced. So they had to produce twice, twice, write twice as many books, they had to do twice as many conferences, and they had to bring in twice as much money. So the, the, the criteria itself was nebulous in the, in the sense that it was person-specific rather than it being applied to everybody. Some of our respondents, um, though not all of them, who were doing work on race and ethnicity, um, felt as though this, re this kind of work was seen as deficit. It wasn't real research. Oh, it's something that you're, you have a personal interest in. Um, it's not real research. Like You're not looking at, for instance, um, leadership and management or schooling, etc. It's just, just something that you yourself are interested in. And in terms of the REF, uh, some of our respondents who were working outside um, the first world, if you like, who were publishing or, or working in, 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 the Af in Africa and India, for instance, felt as though their publications would not be recognised or graded highly as for, compared to those who were working in the US or the UK. So there was a bias in terms of the research that academics were carrying out. So um, individuals wanted to work overseas temporarily because they, wanted, they were unable to get work here. They did feel that... Um, the US especially was considered to be a supportive environment for BME scholars, um, particularly in relation to positive messages that they got from overseas institutions. Um, and this was in fact related to um, the fact that doing, as a BME academic, they would be treated as an equal. There was credibility and status given to BME staff, and there was an, in, there was an intellectual black elite, if you like, black academic elite in the US, particularly around the space that was created for black academics. Uh, and this was the case around, um, particularly the US, the US, because there are historically black universities and colleges in the US, and there are also degrees um, that specifically focus on black African American studies. Um, which is not the case here in, in, in the UK. 
Um, they also felt that it was a much more supportive environment, so there wasn't the tensions and the competitive nature of the REF or the RAE that exists in the UK. There was less of an administrative burden, and the pay terms and conditions were better in the US. So, how do we, um, just to sort of wrap up, how, how, where have we come in the last 25 years since Macpherson, for instance, it's been 20 years since the publication of the Macpherson report? Well, sadly, I argue that we haven't really progressed that much. In fact, I argue that one of the main failures of neoliberalism and neoliberal policy making has been the fact that, that the situation for BME groups has actually deteriorated. It hasn't actually got better. And this is evident most recently because we live in fragile, turbulent, insecure times, do we not? We live in a, in a, in a climate of risk where we have Brexit, Trump, the rise of the far right throughout the world. Um, so I, I argue, I put it to you, that these are not new racisms, these are just old racisms manifesting in different ways. And Bonilla Silva and Foreman, and this quote is from a, a, a piece of their research from 2000, so this is 19 years ago, and this is what they said. And I would argue that all of these quotes are relevant today. So the first one is 19 years ago. A new race talk has emerged in the reproduction of white supremacy. It allows whites to appear not racist, preserve their privileged status, blame blacks for their lower status, and criticise any institutional approach, such as affirmative action, or indeed the Race Equality Charter, that attempts to ameliorate racial inequality. And our piece of research, which we carried out in 2011, where we looked at racism in rural schools and the ways in which racism manifested in rural areas, where, there were, where, there were, uh, where BME individuals were a minority, um, and that, that was absolutely fascinating in terms of what happened when parents complained about racism in predominantly white schools. And we argued in 2011, to argue that post Macpherson has resulted in a post-racial society is utterly absurd. Such discourses serve only to further disadvantage and marginalise black and minority ethnic communities. And we said then, racism exists at every level of society. It permeates our schools, our colleges, and indeed our universities. It is alive in all elements of society, our popular culture, our media, and the social spaces that we occupy. And in 2018, my quote from 2018, higher education institutions are spaces of white privilege, which fail to cater for the experiences of BME groups. I argue that they employ a rhetoric of inclusion, but one that is really evident in practice or outcomes. So those three quotes, 2000, 2011, 2018, are really relevant today. These aren't new racisms. These are just old racisms manifest, manifesting themselves again. So where do we go from here? How can we change things for the better for future generations of students? Well, we need greater visibility of BME staff in academic and, and senior uh, decision-making roles. Universities should provide transparency in their recruitment and progression um, systems. I suggest we have a target system, actually. We can't have a quota system because quota systems are illegal in this country. A target system for BME staff in senior roles so that universities have to tell us who and why they haven't recruited particular BME students, and I'm not, sorry, staff, and I'm not at all um, arguing for a lowering, lowering of standards at all. We need formal networking and mentoring and training for promotion and progression to include mandatory unconscious bias tra training, at the very least at level six, and for those on recruitment and promotion panels. It has to be mandatory, because at the moment there are pockets of excellence in some universities who are doing this extremely well. But believe you me, there's a lot of bad practice. So I argue we need mandatory unconscious bias training. So annual reviews, clear plans which provide evidence on how higher education institutions have addressed racism and indeed the BME attainment gap. Uh, and, and, I, and I say this today given that um, the government has announced that they are going to, uh, to, to um, 
hold universities to account in terms of how they've addressed the BME attainment gap. But because of the B word, am I allowed to say Brexit? We haven't heard anything more um, about that, and I don't know when we will. So again, I argue we should have a target system for BME students who are attending Russell Group and elite higher education institutions. So why is it that one college in Oxford didn't even admit one black student? How can that be the case? So we need to understand that, that we need target systems for these. The Race Equality Charter mark must be linked to funding as is the Athena Swan Charter. Athena Swan Charter for biomedical research funding uh, 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 is linked to funding. So any institution who signed up has to, it has to be linked to funding because once it's linked to funding, universities are more likely to sign up to it. We need national government policies which apply to all higher education institutions rather than having single vice chancellors who are passionate about this, this particular area. All vice-chancellors must see this as something that's a key performance indicator in relation to how their university is performing. And finally, higher education institutions need to acknowledge and address institutional racism and white privilege. How does this impact within the whole community and the experience, not just for staff, but for students themselves in their journeys in higher education? Why is this important? It's important because a failure to acknowledge racism results in a failure to act. Thank you.